Welcome to the Defense and Aerospace Report. I'm Wagner Maradian up here on Capitol Hill, where we have just finished listening to a fascinating Iraq caucus briefing, where the National Democratic Institute uh, gave us a briefing on the latest poll results uh, from Iraq uh, and the Iraqi population. And we have with us uh, Les Campbell, who is the uh, Regional Director for the Middle East at NDI. Les, talk to us a little bit about this GQR poll you guys took, very, very recent. It's from March. What's the temperature of the Iraqi people when it comes to governance, uh, as well as what they think about the future of the country, the fight against ISIS, the whole shoot and match? Sure. Well, we did a, a national poll, um, 2,000 people across the country. But we looked, uh, we oversampled the areas of Mosul, Nineveh, which is the province that uh, contains Mosul, Anbar, predominantly Sunni province, Saladin, also predominantly Sunni. This is all the west of Iraq, uh, because we wanted to see how they would feel once ISIS was presumably defeated. Um, a lot of interesting findings. One is that there's a lot of optimism. Iraqis believe that ISIS will be defeated soon. Um, they're very happy with their army for doing a good job. Uh, the uh, approval level of the army is close to 80 percent, used to be 20 percent, something like that. Um, the Prime Minister Abadi, El Abadi, um, is also very popular right now. He's rebounded from something like 33 percent approval rating to about 60, which is great for him. Um, so that's all the good news. The bad news is that uh, people have very high expectations. They think ISIS will de be defeated, that billions of dollars will roll in for reconstruction, that they will be compensated for losses, um, and that the government will somehow take care of them. And I don't think that's going to happen for a variety of reasons. Uh, there's no capacity, there's no money. Um, so those were two of the big findings. Um, we also found that uh, most people give credit to Iran and Russia. Um, for helping against ISIS. Uh, the U.S. is third on that list. It's a, a little unfair, but that's how people see it. Um, they give credit to uh, the groups called Hasht al-Shabi, or popular mobilization units, which are uh, Shia-driven militias. Um, they've actually done a, a pretty good job, but it's a little scary to have Shia militias running around the country, and so there's a, there's a paradox there as well. People appreciate the fact that they fought ISIS, but they also think that they should go home afterward. Um, so there are a lot of interesting things. I think um, on, the, on the positive side, optimism. Um, security for the first time in more than 10 years is now down the list of, of concerns. Um, that's good. On the negative side, people are looking for jobs and economic opportunity and they don't want corruption. Um, and I'm not sure that the Iraqi government is quite up to delivering that. So it, it's really great to see the optimism, but I'm worried that the expectations are very high and dashed expectations lead to bad things. Let me take you to the investment future question. I mean, that is very, very high expectations that Iraqis think there's going to be some form of restitution from, from the government. Right. Um, one of the things that you mentioned in your briefing, uh, and just to tell everybody, there were numerous members of Congress, but Adam Kinzinger, a Republican from Illinois, and Seth Moulton were the hosts of uh, the Democrat from Massachusetts, were, were hosts of this event, and Secretary Madeleine Albright, who is chairman of MDI uh, and has been associated with it since 2000, well, actually since 1984 yes. and, and chair uh, and chairman uh, since since 2001 of the organization, uh, former Secretary of State and, and U.S. Ambassador to NATO, and once upon a time my mom's boss, uh, I would add, at the U.S. U.S. mission to the U.N. Um, tell us a little bit about this this um, sense that um, politicians are now that they've established security, the population now starts to focus on non-existential issues, right. and so how does this whole restitution political question then resonate uh, more, more broadly with the electorate and potentially backfire? Sure. Um, Iraqi politicians have, you know, have actually traded on the currency of instability for a long time. Um, they've traded on sectarianism for a long time. So the idea being, you know, trust me because I'll protect you from your enemies, or trust me because I'm a Sunni leader and I'll stop the Shia from taking over, or the opposite, uh, Muqtad al-Sadr, a uh, famous Shia kind of firebrand uh, sort of guy is like, I'm the guy that can protect the Shia from, you know, from, from bad things. But now that security has improved a lot, that kind of rhetoric doesn't work as much. People are, there's actually less sectarian feeling among citizens now than there has been in a long time. And they're starting to be optimistic about the future. Security has dropped as a, as a concern to the mid, you know, the mid, middle of the pack. Um, but, you know, as soon as you're not worried about dying tomorrow or you're not, you know, you don't have to worry about can you eat tomorrow or will you have a house tomorrow, your house will get destroyed, you start thinking, well, the government's doing a terrible job. Um, you know, our leaders are terrible. They're corrupt because if they weren't corrupt, then we would have, you know, more prosperity. And, uh, and this is exactly what's going through their minds. So the, the concern about corruption is going through the roof. They're like, okay, well, now that we're, we almost have ISIS defeated, 
where's the money all going? You know, we're a rich country. How come I'm not seeing any of that money? Um, when they were fighting ISIS, they could say, okay, we have to, you know, all hands on deck to fight. But now they're starting to say, okay, well, after this is done, so am I going to get a new house? Am I, you know, is my town going to be rebuilt? And um, if the government does a good job, this could be an opportunity. Everyone kind of shares in the, in the successes. But what is more likely to happen is that the government's broke. Um, it's still full of sectarian divisions. And likely they'll end up fighting and they'll be just frozen. And then the Iraqi citizens, a, a year from now, I'm afraid, I hope not, but I'm afraid they'll be saying, well, that was terrible. Um, we, 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 we defeated them, we sacrificed, and now we have nothing, let's kick the bums out. And, and that would be, I think, be bad because right now you do have some decent, moderate politicians in Iraq, and, and I think they deserve some support. That was a fascinating point you make about you know, how sort of Iraqis see what happens after the war now that uh, it does look like there's going to be victory. But this is a two-part question. Part one was you guys found fascinatingly that a lot of Iraqis say the number one thing is, you know, we were for Sunnis in particular, we were forced uh, into this. At the same time, they expressed concerns about the existence of continuing sleeper cells, which may indicate, you know, were they forced to fight for Iraq or for ISIS? Or did they fight for ISIS and are now looking at that as an excuse to say, well, you know, we, you know, talk to us about some of the dynamics here that are going on and what are the residual implications of that, uh, that kind of thinking among the population? Well, there, there are a few paradoxes in this poll. So um, the majority of Sunnis in the provinces where ISIS became dominant um, say they were forced to participate if they participated at all with ISIS that they were afraid that they could be kidnapped or their children would, would be held against their will and so on. And yet, later on when we said, you know, thinking of all the reasons that someone might join ISIS, what are the top two reasons? Uh, the top reason that people gave was the religious beliefs. Um, so there was an attractiveness to the religious beliefs. So it kind of goes against this idea that they were forced. Well, were you forced or was there attractiveness for a variety of reasons, including religious beliefs? Um, the other paradox is that uh, people say that they were forced to join ISIS, that they, that they didn't really support them, and yet when they're asked if they're afraid that ISIS will come back, they say yes, and they're mostly afraid that there are sleeper cells still there. These are people that live in places like Mosul say there are sleeper cells. Well, a sleeper cell, by definition, are, are local people who have, you know, kind of dig back into the normal life and then could be reactivated later. So if they're sleeper cells, then, then that means that they're obviously not being forced. So I, I don't think the majority, or even, even close to a majority, of, of the citizens of, of um, Mosul or um, Nineveh province were ISIS supporters. I really think it's a small uh, group. However, it's there, and a lot of it is, in, is indigenous. And a lot of these are, are folks who maybe had army training before. They, they, they are part of the community and they have sunk back into the community. And so uh, it could easily be that, uh, that, that, that ISIS could come back with sleeper cells or that they could reconstitute themselves, um, get people recruited again and become a danger again if things are just left as they are. So in other words, the defeating ISIS is not just a matter of driving them out militarily, which will probably happen. It might take longer than we think, but it'll happen. It's making sure that after the fact that there is just no good, attractive reason that these sleeper cells would, would again reemerge. Let me take you to the broader American strategy uh, in Iraq. Uh, you disagreed with the last administration's strategy of, of leaving. Uh, Obama administration said, well, the Iraqis didn't want us there, and so that's why we had to leave. We couldn't negotiate a SOFA. There are a lot who have criticized that. Senator McCain, most prominently, you were a critic. A number of other folks were critics. I believe Secretary Albright was a little critical of the sort of abrupt disengagement that there existed from, uh, from Iraq. Um, what is the kind of investment. So if you say, for example, that a majority of Iraqis believe that there should be restitution and that I am somehow going to be make, made whole for whether there were war losses or property losses or anything else, what is the kind of investment package that is going to be necessary and for how long to stabilize this key country and, in Mr. Kinzinger's words, to turn it into a constructive, productive American ally in the region? Well, first of all, it could be a constructive American ally. There is a lot of goodwill toward the U.S. in Iraq. There really is. Um, very little bad will. Even some of the leaders that were seen as anti-American before are at least silent these days. Um, secondly, the U.S. presence in Iraq right now in terms of training and, and advising and uh, airstrikes and so on is generally appreciated. It's, I mean, if there's any opposition, it's very muted. It really is you know, very little opposition. 
Um, there will have to be rebuilding afterward. Iraq, though, is a rich country. Of, you know, the oil prices are down now, but if they're up again, it'll be rich in oil, it's rich in agriculture, it has water, it has uh, you know, well-educated people. It's not a basket case by any stretch of the imagination. It's incredibly strategic in terms of its location. So it's a good country to have on board, honestly, as an ally, and Iraq would like to be an ally. But you know, we have to maintain um, probably the military presence, maybe not at this level, but at some significant level. Iraqis want that, particularly the Sunnis want that. Um, we have to try to attract American companies to go back and to ally with other international companies. There could be a lot of rebuilding, there's a lot of money in that, that's good for everyone, investment and so on. But I think walking away, which is more or less what happened a few years ago, saying, look, this is a morass, um, is not the right thing to do because we'll be dealing with ISIS, you know, Mark II or Mark III or whatever. Um, you know, unfortunately, the Middle East, uh, I know that a lot of people would like just to wipe their hands of it. It doesn't work that way. It's, you know, full of issues that we have to stay engaged with. Um, you know, right now, President Trump is looking at Palestinian-Israeli peace. That's great. I hope that works out. But we also have to, um, you know, look at these allies like Iraq. Um, someone said to me recently, and it's, uh, as far as I know, it's true, that um, Iraqi politicians these days are taking trips to Moscow and Iran. Um, they're going there for even study missions to see how the, you know, the parliaments, for example, of Iran and Moscow work. I'd rather have them come to the U.S. Congress and, and see how this, uh, you know, this system works and, and have the affinity to the U.S. than have the affinity to Iran and Russia, and that means we have to stay engaged. You've been associated with NDI since 1994. Uh, you've been all around the region. You're the director of regional studies. Um, what do you think are the keys to building democratic institutions in countries that, to this day, still prefer very much a strongman model? Mosul is about to be liberated. Nobody in Mosul wants a politician. They want a military governor overseeing it. Um, this notion that we have, you know, int interesting that we had it on a bipartisan uh, level. You know, what is the, the Trump administration? Decentralization, pushing power to people more broadly to make those decisions to states, whereas that is antithetical to sort of the mentality that has existed in the, in the region. Given these, this sort of dichotomy, um, how do you foster democratic institutions, foster and drive forward this message at a time when you could argue that the biggest democracy in the region, Turkey, has regressed right back to an authoritarian state? It's a tough question. I don't have an easy answer except to say that uh, in all my experience, uh, individuals really do want to control the decisions that affect their lives. They want accountability. They don't want corruption. They want transparency. They want to know what their leaders are up to. Um, but they also want security and they want to eat. And so there is this constant kind of tug between transparency and accountability and security. And right now, the pendulum is swinging a little bit toward authoritarian leaders um, in, a, in times of uncertainty, in times of change. And uh, I'm not sure you can really stop that. I think, um, you know, it's, uh, I, I think history is kind of long. I think we overreact a little bit. I don't think it's, um, you know, I think there have been many times in, in the last couple of hundred years that people have swung a little bit um, toward, uh, you know, the authoritarian side of things. We just came out of what's often called the third wave of democracy, where more than 100 countries in the last 30 years went the democratic direction. That has subsided a little bit. It's, it's retracting a little bit. But that doesn't mean that it's over. So I think um, overall, and I, I've been working in the Middle East for almost 25 years, people really, really want what democracy brings. Um, but it's, it's tough. I mean, it's, democracy is very difficult. It's very cyclical. It's uh, messy. Decisions are made very easily and so on. So, um, you know, how do you mix that in the Middle East um, wh where you have a messy, slow decision-making process, but you have more transparency and accountability, but you mix that with a, with a region that is desperate for security and certainty and stability? And I think it can be done, but it's not easy. I mean, it's, I, I, I'm try not trying to get out of the question, but I think it's just continue the effort. Don't give up. Don't, don't walk away. Um, you know, we just have to stay with them and, and keep working. And, uh, and honestly, we have a lot of work to do on our own democracy as well. It's not like we're perfect. And so it's not that we're going there to preach about our way of life. But I think we're, at, you know, I hope we act as partners and say, let's work on this together because a country like Iraq um, should be an ally. Let's work together. The administration's uh, budget, very, very deep, cut, deep cuts to foreign aid, percentage cut. We heard Secretary uh, Albright make clear that we shouldn't do this on a percentage basis. You know, if you're going to make cuts, do it in a thoughtful manner. Take a look at it. See and assess what the impact and implications are. From your standpoint, how devastating a budget is this to achieve 
these cr softer and yet critical goals, you know, whereas the administration's view is this is a hard power budget, as Mick Mulvaney has said, and there's a $54 billion upfront increase in the base budget, likely to be even more, you know, another $65 billion uh, in, in the supplemental. Sure. Well, first of all, the, the funding for democracy, um, human rights, governance type of work has been going down for a long time. That's not that new. It's, uh, it's been reducing slowly. Um, in the last couple of years, there's been a bit of a resurgence. The last year of Obama and now the, this last, the omnibus that was just passed actually was very good. Um, but the budget that, uh, as presented by the Trump administration would absolutely gut um, the, the, this work that I think is so important in terms of helping to create better governance and better institutions and stability through governance and strong institutions. And the hard power part of it, um, you know, kinetic as the military likes to call it, or, you know, kind of boots on the ground or bombing and so on, um, only goes so far. Sometimes it's necessary, but uh, to win the peace, which I guess is a cliche, but it's so true, you have to invest in leadership, you have to invest in institutions, local institutions, good, you know, municipal governance, parliaments, the National Army as an institution, education, finance ministries, you know, a country like Iraq needs to be a, a functioning federal system where resources are shared equitably among regions. The Sunni population needs to feel that they're part of things and be represented. None of that is done through a military budget. It's done through diplomacy and it's done through funding NGOs and supporting moderate leaders, uh, not with money, but with training and, and advice. And uh, it's really not expensive. A very tiny fraction of the overall budget, maybe less than a half a percent, um, actually goes to providing training and advice to people who are creating governance structures in countries, and that's what brings stability. So you can, you can win a war, you can win a fight, but if you don't have stable, competent government afterwards, you're going to be right back in there trying to fight again. And for the half of 1% of the total international affairs budget, that's not the budget of the government, that's just the international affairs budget, it's a tiny little price to pay. And let me ask you one last question on, on NDI. Uh, Ronald Reagan founded it uh, to foster democracies uh, during the height of the Cold War is, is when he did that. Um, you guys have adapted. You joined it right after the end of the Cold War, in fact, and engaged it. Talk to us a little bit about how the organization, its roots, and a lot of people don't know as much about it as they should, and the role that you guys play with incredibly prominent people, for example, like Secretary Albright. Sure. Uh, well, there were actually, in, the, in 1984, under Ronald Reagan, as you mentioned, four institutions were started. The National Democratic Institute, my organization, the International Republican Institute, which has a relationship to the Republic Republican Party, the International Center for Labor Solidarity, which is related to the AFL-CIO, and the Center for International Private Enterprise related to the American Chamber of Commerce. And the idea under the Reagan administration was, let's have these organizations work abroad as an expression of American values and, and what we care about and what may, makes us successful. And it's a bipartisan um, initiative. We work very closely with uh, our Republican counterpart, IRI, abroad. We share offices often. We work in lockstep. Um, I've, al I've always said that, uh, you know, the partisanship ends when you leave the country. It should end when you leave the country. I don't, you know, I don't see helping people abroad as a partisan issue. It's, it should be multipartisan, and that's how we behave. But we also, we don't choose um, winners or losers. We don't fund political parties. We don't, we don't uh, interfere in politics. We provide advice and training. I have a background in politics and parliament in Canada, actually, many, many years ago. And when I'm abroad, I, I talk about my experiences and how parliaments can function better and political parties and, you know, how to train a volunteer or, you know, make a cheap campaign, something like that. We also work with the Europeans. Our, our director in, uh, in Iraq is from Romania. Our director in Jordan is from Kosovo. So we bring all these experiences abroad and uh, we provide training and advice. And uh, we do it in a, in a multi-partisan way and we work with business and with labor as well. And I think it's a great model. It's very cheap comparatively to, to other types of investments, and it's been supported over the years by, by both parties consistently and every president since Reagan. Les Campbell, uh, Regional Director for the Middle East at the National Democratic Institute, thanks so much for spending so much time with us. It's been my pleasure. Thank you.